uh, from the beginning is a new subject. The game of life. The game of life. Game of life. And this is one you better win, right? Yeah. I'll pray, we will begin. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful this morning for life and life more abundantly. Give us grace as we spend a few hours studying the game of life. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so a little quick question. Mm -hmm. Are we finished with school? No. no. We're going along on different ones. We just added another one in. Yeah, I, was, I felt needled in this direction. So, yeah, thought I'd put it in. Now, you ought to know the rules before you play the game. You'd agree, right? Because if you don't know the rules, there's no possibility you're going to win. Because you've got to play by the rules. Why do you call this Christian battle a game? I did and God did. Who'd like to read? Riches, pleasures, pleasures, all are used by Satan in playing the game of life for the humans. Now, if you lose this game, that's, you, it. That's, that's it. Thank you. That's, better. that's it. <laughs> this is a game you cannot afford to lose. You got to know the rules this morning. The first rule in playing the game of life. Thank you. First rule in playing the game of life. Now, first, uh, before we get that, before we get to that, you need to know more than the rules. <laughs> you need to know the rule maker. Mm -hmm. Now, who read? We have nothing to fear for the future, except as we shall forget the way the Lord has led us and his teachings in our past history. Uh, How has he led us? I tell you, he's led me. He's leading me to obey the rules, right? Because that's the only way to win. Yeah, he's the rule maker. No, that went the wrong way, sorry. <laughs> wrong button. We read this yesterday. And this is where kind of I got the idea. Sure. Because shifting blame evidently become, can become habitual, right? Become a habit. Let them overcome the habits of hasty speech and the desire to blame others. Now, how do you overcome a bad habit? Stop. By choosing Okay. If you just stop doing it, then you're left in like a vacuum. You, instead of a bad habit, like instead of going to the beer joint, now I'm going to the library. Or church, <laughs> library, whatever. Right? <laughs> and can I make that habitual? Yeah. Just do it enough, right? Do it enough. So, uh. Once you sweep your house clean, you have to fill it with something. So You've got to. Spirit or else it'll come back. It's, a it's a spiritual coma. It's like yeah. it's inaction. It's indifference, Laodicean condition. It's like, you know, something's going to fill up something. <laughs> you are built for action. You cannot just sit there and do nothing. Can you? No. Yeah. You can't sit there, the, the new age, right? Make your mind a blank. Um, you really can't. I mean, something's going to fill your mind up. Make your mind a blank so the power can come in. No, no, no. You, just, you, know, you can't be a blank. And now, this is uh, where the game, where you enter the game. This is where you enter. When you make the decision to come into the church, then the game begins. And uh, this is the picture, right? Paul baptized the household of Stephanus, Stephanus, however you want to say it. Then he said, I didn't baptize anybody else as far as I know. You know, Paulos baptized, Peter baptized, others baptized. I didn't baptize anybody except these guys. Now, when he closes this letter in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 15, he refers back to chapter 1 about this household as they came into the game. And it's the only time the old King James Bible, Bible uses the word addict or addicted. I, I keep referring to this all the time. Today, we'll look at it. It's the only time the King James Bible uses the word addict or addicted. Is it a good thing to be an addict? No. no. Depends, on addicted. Depends on what you're addicted to. Uh, I'm addicted to 5 o'clock. I've got I to do what? In the morning. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm up by then. I got to go walk. I'm addicted, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Your creatures are happy. You do the same thing every morning. Yeah. Don't tell me you don't. Your creatures are happy. You do the same thing. You go to the bathroom. Yeah. You do that. You walk. You go to the bathroom. Whatever you do, yeah. you do the same thing. If you're in your home environment, because your creatures are habit. Mm -hmm. We're built to be habitual. Yes. Yeah. And you develop habits. What you choose to do, you choose it. You choose it. Then it becomes easy. Second thought, you don't think about it. This is when you enter the game. Now, uh, it depends on what you're addicted to. 
Who'd like to read this uh, interesting sentence? By the way, this is how you win. First step, we haven't got to rule one yet. First step, you've got to change your habits. Instead of going down to the idol shop, now Stephanus and his household are going down to the God shop. Who read? I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the They have addicted themselves. <laughs> they wake up in the morning doing what? <laughs> I gotta have a what? I gotta have a, I gotta have a what? Cigarette or coffee or no, I'll give a treatment. Or, or, or but they've addicted themselves to the what? To the ministry of the saints. Yeah. They used to wake up, gotta have a cigarette, gotta have a cup of coffee, gotta have some porno. But now they say what? Oh, I gotta give a treatment. Gotta read. Gotta read John four, John five. Gotta walk. Gotta walk. Yeah, John five. Yeah, that's it. Gotta start praying. John five. The pool, huh? Go ahead, no, go ahead, go ahead, read, 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 read. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. And these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. Lahem bread. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Beth, house. Uh, yeah, Beth means house, house of bread. Bethel, I have faith, uh, house of God. You know, so uh, Beth. Esta. Beth means house. What's that word Esta mean? Anybody know? Anybody speak Hebrew? I don't, but I looked it up. It means all. Uh, and, and these lay a great and these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the waters. Somebody finish the sentence for me. Uh, who gets healed? It's the who gets the healing? The sick people. Which one? First one to jump in the water. That is the mindset of the masses. First one in gets the healing. So now you walk up to the pool of Bethesda. There's a man that is, and Jesus did, there's a man that had been laying there a long time. And if, and what, uh, this troubling of the waters, that's all, that wasn't yeah. it. But let's, let's say it, it was true. I walk up and there's a man, old man, I see the water's troubled. What should I do? You should help him, but you dump him. <laughs> it depends on what you're addicted to. If it's the ministry of the saints, I take what I throw him in. If I'm addicted to, then I throw myself in. Wouldn't you agree? Now, what is that, uh, that thing named me now? Bethesda. Esda means Beth Esda. Bethesda means house of grace or house of mercy. In the Bible, mercy and grace often are synonymous, Hebrews 4.15, that you might receive what? Mercy and grace. According to His mercy to, us, uh, to Titus 3, verse 5, He saved us. Now, who'd like to read this? As we're getting close to the rule number one. Every kind and sympathizing word spoken to the sorrowful, every act to relieve the oppressed, and every gift to need, if promoted by a right motive, will result in blessings to the giver. Okay. Prompted, Prompted by the right motive. The rule of this game, number one, is played with your heart, not with your mind. If your motives are wrong, then you're wrong. You fail the game. Would you agree? So far, so good? Now, you can never understand the rules because when we read the first rule, you're going to say, that makes no sense. I don't know if I believe that. It makes no sense. If you look at the rules with your mind, they'll never make sense. Because it makes no sense that God would become a man and be crucified, stripped naked, and hung on a cross. That makes no sense. Does it? God's a baby wearing diapers? That makes no <laughs> sense. Peter's fishing for a coin? That makes no sense. Balaam's arguing with his jackass? That makes no <laughs> sense. There are many things in the Bible that makes no sense. Luke Heath in the Bible class? That makes no sense to me back then, but I got addicted to the ministry of the saints. <laughs> now this is going to be tough for some people. Uh, every kind of sympathizing word spoken to the sorrowful, every act to relieve the oppressed. Somebody finish the sentence for me. Acts 20, 35, it's more blessed to? Give ah, it's a blessing in giving. It's not receiving. Being all about you is a curse. Being all about them is a blessing. We're almost to rule number one. That's, that's the human. That's what the human it's a human, man. It's the human. Self is the yeah. greatest enemy of us. It's the... It's it likes to receive. The FBI, top 10 most wanted. For Lou Keith, top 10 most wanted. <laughs> Self. Picture me. <laughs> now, Philippians 2 5, right? Let this mind. Yeah, let this mind. You're at the uh, Pool of Bethesda. You got his mind, not yours. 
so the water is troubled. What do you do with that man? And again, I realize superstition and water trouble. I, I know that. I know throwing somebody in, that's not how God works. The water is troubled. It's him or me. Him or me. And uh, that's the game. How about if you jump in together? <laughs> Their superstitious custom was that water. one got the healing, the first one in. Mr. Dwight writes on uh, uh, the Zara of Ages, some are stampeded. Mm -hmm. As they just get to the water, somebody tramples them to death and jumps in. Mm -hmm. Now, somebody read this, and by the way, this was not a member of our church. Mm -hmm. They read John 4 and John 5, the Pool of Bethesda, and they took that picture. That was not taken by a member of our church. If you look at if you, mm -hmm. I could blow it up. That's John 4 and John 5. That's John 5 and 4. How in the world could they connect that with John 4 and 5? Better question, how could you not? We're there. Rule number one. I don't know how many we're going get to get in these next few days. I don't know. I don't know what's coming. But I know what's here today. <laughs> right? Makes no sense. Now, I'll have to read this one. The whole missionary work will be farther advanced. We want that, don't we? We want some advancement here at Boulder Creek. Mm -hmm. In every way, when a more liberal, self-denying, and self-sacrificing spirit is manifested for the prosperity of foreign missions, are you about to? Am I about to say to make a success at home, you got to leave home? That's what Jesus did. That's what Abraham did. This is what he asked us to. That's rule number one in the game of life. Because you read the rest and you see that's right. Uh, for the prosperity, wait a minute, if you leave home, then the home breaks down. Who's going to mind the fires? Who's going to keep the home fires burning? Ah, you got to read the rest. For the prosperity of the homework depends largely under God upon the reflex influence of the evang evangelical work done where? Afar off. It makes no sense. You're thinking with your brain, not with your heart. Mm -hmm. If you want this place to prosper, you leave here and help somebody else. Mm -hmm. I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. Is heaven a ghost town? You want the verses? Yeah, mm -hmm. heaven became a ghost town. John 3.16, I put it with Romans 8.32. Uh, uh, he, I'm sorry, he spared, he, for God so loved the world, He, Romans 8, 32, spared not His own Son. That's the, that's the Son. Now the Father, uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, to wit, God was in Christ, reconciled the world unto Himself. John 15, I'm sorry, John 15, 25, 26, and He sent the Holy Spirit. Uh, Hebrews 1, 14, are not the angels all sent? What? Here. It's a ghost town. They left heaven to secure heaven. I'll read you a statement that says that. They left heaven to secure it. You leave Butler Creek to secure it. Now, there's more. If I sound like a, a ranting lunatic, let's read more. Who read? Nothing will give greater spiritual strength and a greater increase of earnestness and depth of feeling than visiting and ministering to the sick. Can't we just bring the sick folks here? <laughs> uh, yeah, not many will come here. And that's the problem. And if they don't come here, yeah, we've got to work. John 13, 15, to give you an example, you should do as I have done. What would you do, Jesus? Left home. I came down here because you can't go up there. All right? Mm -hmm. Je Jesus left home to save home. And, uh, well, well was no, home wasn't endangered. Uh, that's not what God says. Home is a five-star danger. I'll read the first little teeny paragraph. Somebody can read the last. The heavenly universe was secured. Was secured from what? An eternal allegiance. It was secured. They left to secure heaven. From what? Who will read? It was because of the issues at stake that the inhabitants of the unfallen words watched with such intense interest the struggle between the prince of life and the prince of darkness. Those who had not sinned needed not the application of Christ's blood, but, but did need to be made secure from Satan's power. They were not secure. Mm -hmm. The universe was at stake. stake. That's the game. Yeah, she said that thing about that the sal um, salvation of, of man is just about 
bigger picture. The bigger picture. First Corinthians 4 9, we are made a spectacle to the world, to the angels, and to men. It's a bigger picture. Safe and secure. So I quoted 2 Corinthians 5 19, to wit, God was in Christ, different, a different version. God was reconciling the world to himself and making the universe secure. Now give us an application of the first uh, little rule of the game. Okay. I wonder where that is. Sunshine. That's Ryan's house. Here's a better picture. <laughs> I got to really talk fast and make long story short. It's not, it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah, the, it's a long story. Wildwood Hospital shows this place. That was the price tag, $379,000. We had in our fund to buy a new place to move out of the city into the country $2,000. We were $377,000 short. <laughs> And I don't have time to go through it all. But God did a miracle. He did multiple miracles and we got here. I just, I just not, there's no time. Multiple miracles and we got here. And uh, of course, Wildwood and providentially, they asked Darlene, I was the education director at the College of Health. They asked me to come here and start the ministry. I had for about many, many, many years been working with Wildwood's overseas ministries. They asked Darlene if I would come here and you know, we'd start a health ministry. That's the way it looked when we moved in. It had no furniture. Nobody knew we were here. We had no money. We had no nothing. That uh, wooden barn that's just from the health center, if you look down the, the hill, there's an old wooden barn down there. I pulled off about five or six boards, built a table, went to Dollar Tree, bought two green plastic chairs, sat down and said, Lord have mercy. We got no money. Nobody knows we're here. We got no furniture. We got nothing except an invitation to start a health ministry in the middle of nowhere. <coughs> now, that was our home. We lived up in that attic, Ryan, for two years. Wow. Now, law number one, if you want home to prosper, you leave home. Leave home. We're leaving. So, I continued working in the, these are the jungles of Southeast Asia. The thing to do if you want to work at home to prosper, is you leave home. So this is uh, uh, the island of Luzon. This is the northern part. This is how they mix concrete there. This is how you get your lumber. You call a guy to come out with a chainsaw wearing flip-flops, <laughs> and he cuts the coconut trees. And you dig everything with a shovel. Now, I look 100 years old in this picture, but I felt 200 years old. <laughs> you should not be clearing the jungles when you're my age. So this is where we were. And this is, uh, had some volunteers coming to help us. So if you see some, some, some Oriental guys, some American guys, they were coming to help build. Guess what we're building there? Uh, the Wildwood International School of Health Education. But wait a minute. You didn't have one here. And you go there to build one. It will help them. <laughs> the way to get one here is to what? Yeah. Build one there. Nobody believes this. This guy, this Korean guy that came to help. They got the monsoon rains pouring down rain. And uh, so that's uh, what Rodney Bowles. Some of you know him, Rodney. He's one of the vice presidents in ASI today. And uh, they're building. So you mix concrete. And this guy's laying the block. And I'm just going through very quickly. And so the health center is going up in the jungle, right? Mm -hmm. And that's about the last picture I have of it. Then we went back where? Home. <laughs> oh. No health center at home. And I got a call from some Amish men. And they said, we want to come down and build you a health center in two and a half days. Mm -hmm. And I said, I didn't really believe the guy at first, mm -hmm. but I, get, you know, I got some evidence. I said, we want to build your health center in two and a half days. I said, we got no staff. We got no money. We got, we got nothing. He said, don't worry about it. And I thought, this can't be happening. And uh, he told me, he said, the one thing you need to do is have a foundation on which we can build. We can't build it if there's no foundation. Call me when you get one. I said, we don't have anything to put on top of the foundation. He said, I got nine brothers. One owns a window factory, one owns a door factory, one owns a sawmill, one owns everything. And I said, you're in Indiana, and we're 10 hour drive away. He said, don't you worry, I'll mail it down there. You call me when you get a foundation. I've almost never in my life asked for money, almost never in my life. But what helped us to get this building, there was a lady, her name was Ruth Potts, precious lady living in Florence. She donated $10,000 toward the price of this house. If we would buy it, why would we buy it? 
I called Ruth Potts. I said, Sister Ruth, I got to ask you. She was a Seventh-day Adventist then in the Florence Church. Her husband was an attorney. I said, I need to ask you something. She said, go ahead, brother. What do you need? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, uh, I need $5,000 to buy some blocks. <laughs> and she said, immediately the check's in the mail. I said, okay. So it came. Now that was to buy the blocks and the concrete and whatever. So we dug the footing. And then I said, Lord, have mercy. Don't know how to lay block. And this is a few, this is the family sent. I got a call from these people. That was the husband, the wife, and the son. I got a call from that man. He said, we lay block for Walmart in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. We hear you need a block layer. I thought, well, how did he hear that? Uh -huh. And I said, yes, we do. Precious Catholic family. Son was all tattooed up. This precious family. They came down and they... Uh, built that wall that was for uh, built the wall for the foundation the wife was quite a uh, block layer herself mm -hmm. and there was the wall nice wall huh there it is mm -hmm. and of course i just bush hogged the forest off of that that hillside mm -hmm. and i called the amish guy i said I got a foundation <laughs> he said okay we'll put the house in the mail we talked about how big and he said i got a huge house uh, 30 uh, i'm sorry 32 by 60. He said, they'd make a nice size for the health center. And that's the size we built it. It's after the Amish guy that built it, his house. <laughs> Darlene drew the plans. And I said, well, how are you going to mail that down here? It's going to need a big envelope or something. And he said, well, you don't worry. I'm going to send you down what we'll need to build a house. Then uh, three days, the mail arrived. And so his truck after truck after truck of stuff started coming. Mm -hmm. And I had a forklift, these guys, and then we stacked it around the health center. So it was head high all around the wall. I called the guy, his name was Ben Graber, by the way. I said, Ben, everything, that's like I was in a dream world there for a while. I said, Ben, my Amish brother, <laughs> what's an Amish? I said, uh, we've got everything settled here. It's all here. He said, we'll be there on Tuesday. Now they don't drive. It's a long drive from uh, Indiana when you don't drive. It's a long story, can't tell you, don't have time. So uh, I got up on the road. There was no driveway. There was no, it was a mud hole with a, with a concrete thing. He said, five o'clock on Tuesday, we'll be there. We got two groups. There's some old men we're sending. We got some young men. I was up on the road at five o'clock and a van pulled up. The door opened. And I said, morning, fellas. How you doing? And a bunch of children walked right past me. <laughs> I looked around for their parents. And uh, they got their little tool belts on. And God sent all his children to build that health center in uh, two and a half days. Now, uh, 6524, I had to stick that on there, right? Yeah, this is uh, the first Samuel, first Samuel, chapter 7, verse 12, the Ebenezer, right? Uh, this is my Ebenezer, that health center over there. You look at it, you don't see anything. I look at it, I see a five-star miracle. I can give them to you all day long. I've seen hundreds here. But you have to play the game to see the miracle because you don't see a miracle unless you take a risk. And there is no risk outside the game. There is no risk. By the way, you want to read something interesting? Search uh, The Game of Life from Mrs. White and you read all the times how, when she says it and how she uses that phrase. Of course, the Amish people were learning to build since they were just young tykes. And when those guys got here, then the old guys rolled up. And the band later, 20 minutes later, this is the oldest of the old guy. He was 31 years old. Oh. Yeah, that was it. I got to be very good friends with that man. A year later, I went and stayed in his home, and they invited me to hold meetings for the, in the Amish community. It was in a different house every night, and I stayed in his home. So these are the guys. This is the inside. I was just handing them boards and talking to them at night. They wanted to study the Bible. We did. And uh, they brought their... Now, the guys that, the guys that are clean-shaven aren't married. If you're married, you can't shave. And so the guys that were older, they came, they were young, but they had children, many children. And they brought their children with them. And this is a good, yeah, hundred, I see these things, and it's got hundreds of things to say. I mentioned one time in a prayer about a prayer book in the basement, and the guy reading from the prayer book, that's the guy, the blue shirt, Lester Graber. A dear friend of mine, dear friend. And so the walls are going up. This is how it looked at the end of the first day. First day, yeah. Now there were 12 of them. And they were all builders. They didn't work together, but still they were all builders. They went to the same church, Cheryl Amish, in <laughs> any little churches. They knew each other. And so we started the second day, and this is, and by the way, they had a rule, don't take our picture. So I had to sneak around. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, no, no. No, yeah. I just, I'm sorry. <laughs> Can I take your picture? No. <laughs> That's why you don't see too many close-ups. So this is the, kind of the end of the second day. The walls are up. And I think uh, somewhere around the roof's about to go on the end of the second day. So the third day came. Uh, I can't, no time to tell you. There's so many things. Third day came, and basically it was shingling the roof. at 12 of them. It goes on pretty fast when you shingle 12 people. And then they put the windows in, and they put the doors on, and then they, uh, and that's about, not quite, that's almost how it looked when they left, except they had windows and doors. They put the lock on, locked it. He gave me the keys. This is Darlene. You say, what was she doing with the women and the children? What do you think she was doing? Yes. In what way? Cooking. Cooking. Show them how to make bread. Mm -hmm. They were big on lard pies. <laughs> Darlene was big on oat pies. <laughs> and, and there they were. Some of the wives, they're making bread. That's bread on the table. How to make homemade bread without lard, right? That's sunshine. They have cooking classes going. Mm -hmm. I've got to just tell you one. The clock says shut up. I can't shut up on this one. This is just one little one. This is the guy, Ben Graber, who arranged it all. And uh, by the way, I told him, I warned him, we had no money. He said, I, he said, don't worry about it. He brought all this stuff down here. We had no money. And I knew two and a half days. He's going, <laughs> and I went up to him. I said, Ben, I said, I don't have any money. And the guy gave me $16,000. Now, the total bill for this materials at a huge discount was $35,000. I said, somebody gave me 16000 And he said, I'll send you a bill for the rest. Hmm. And then the uh, last day, this is kind of the last day, um, we had $500 in the bank at that time. I mean, emergencies. I went and got it out. And I said, look, this is, this is all we got. I said, this is not for the building thing, but can you give it to like a, a widow up there? House burns down or something, you know, you give it to something. You know, this is a donation for your church, your family. He looked, he said, you need it worse than we do. Those guys made a lot of money up there. He said, you need it worse than I do. The guy's house is the house size of our health center. Yeah. yeah. And they don't have electricity. <laughs> but, and uh, now these were Christian, by the way. They believed the Bible. Mm -hmm. We studied the Bible. Mm -hmm. Zealous Christians. I said, Ben, don't you believe in God? Don't you believe God can give it back if we need it? I had him, right? He had oh, oh, oh. <laughs> And I said, here, God can send it right back if we need it. As I put it in his hand, boom. The guy walked up, the guy that drove him, his name is Lemuel Vega, tapped on my shoulder, handed me an envelope. As I put it in his hand, I took an envelope from Lemuel Vega. He said, this is from the guy I stayed with the next year. Open the thing up, guess what was inside? Now, I looked at Ben, as I opened it, I said, I wonder what's inside? I looked, I said, guess what's inside, Ben? He said, not $500. <laughs> there was $500 in that envelope as a donation. <laughs> And I asked, it didn't take long, God long to give it back. Now, most people, this doesn't phase at all. Mm -hmm. But these are the rules of the game. Mm -hmm. You walk by 2 Corinthians 5, 7, faith and not by sight. If it's all about you, you'll never go anywhere. You'll never get off the ground. Mm -hmm. It's got to be about somebody else other than you. It's more blessed to what? Give than to receive. Pull a Bethesda, you throw them in first. You leave home if you want home to prosper. It can't be thinking about you. Am I there? No. <laughs> but I want to be coming to the game, right? So this is when they're getting ready to leave, and I, I thought I got to stick this verse on top. Now it was another year and a half before we got electricity and, and the floors and the cabinets, but the Amish people came back, 300 of them for two year, year and a half. And by the way, they got home, sent me the bill. The bill was for thirty-five thousand dollars minus the sixteen thousand on the bottom. It said stamped in red, paid in full. Your friends the Amish mm -hmm. didn't cost us one penny. Then they came back the first time. I thought it was over. I thought, but there's nothing inside. There are no rugs. There are no floor. There are no walls. There are no wiring. There are no plumbing. There are no cabinets. There are no nothing. Then I got a phone call from my friends, the Amish. He said, how are we going to get in and out of there if there's no driveway? I said, there's this. Well, you get in and out of where? Down there. When we come down to help, how are we going to get in and out without a driveway? Something like that. And I says, well, he said, I happen to be in business of making driveways. <laughs> so wherever you are. And this is the guy. Now, by the way, we went into business together when he came down. So he brought down his equipment. He had a, what do you call it, a bobcat thing, a little thing that pushes it around. And that man had, they don't use landlines, but they used to, got three cell phones, always talking business. 
The guy was 27 years old. I'll show you a picture in a second. Some other guys came with him. This is the guy that came with him. This is the thing. That's what he brought down the machine. And that's the man in the blue shirt smoothing out the concrete. And uh, his name was, uh, I don't think I'm going to tell you. His name was, he was a businessman times 10. This is, a, this is all business. He had no time for anything except business. When he got ready to leave, I said, uh, his name is Jonas. I said, Jonas. I said, I got a business proposition. Mm -hmm. Business proposition, huh? Okay. <laughs> uh, let's talk about it. <laughs> I said, have a seat. Let me show you that guy. The guy was just, this is him. This is this, is this guy. Here he is. I said, here's my, here's my offer. You build me a driveway. And the guy's thinking, I did build, just build him a driveway. That's your part, you build me a driveway. I just built you a driveway. I've done my part, yeah. My part is I pray for you the rest of my life. He said, oh, okay. He said, that's a deal. And I had been praying for him from that day until now, Jonas. So that's when they rolled out of here. Where'd we get the driveway? Now you know. And that's, uh, that's when we rolled out here. So now we had a driveway. Now, I'm going to apply some things. This is from the uh, source from the bottom, United Nations. If you look at the spike in population, population is going up, right? You got, you got the uh, first world or the more, more uh, uh, prosperous countries down in the green, right? And you got the poor folks up in the purple. The, po the, the population in the green is doing what? Yeah, it's taking a slight decline. Mm -hmm. But the poor folks are doing what? Ooh. And if you look, I kind of put the box in for you, the black thing. If you look at the, uh, the, the explosion of population, important point, the explosion of population, the greatest explosion of population is happening in the time in which we live right now here at Boulder Creek. It's now. Those are the poor folks. Or will every one of them hear the gospel before it's all over with? Yeah. Yes, 24, 14 of Matthew, right? Uh, 14, 6 of Revelation. Everybody's going to hear it. The people, most of the people we preach to will be what? Poor, poor folks. And poor folks ain't coming to a health center. You've got to go to them. Yeah, knowledge is increased. Man's running to and fro. But the increase to knowledge is met by an increase in ignorance. And ignorance is not bliss. Now, this is a 1040 window. You got the 10 and the 40 line of latitude, right? This defines that window. Here's just a few facts about it. I, can't get, I don't have glasses enough to read it. But all the poor folk, most of the Muslims, the Buddhists, and the Jainists, and the, uh, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the Hindus, this is where all are, they're all hanging out. The unreached cities. 95% of the, what these people are unevangelized. Another one says 97 have never heard the Bible. The great majority, nine, 95, 97%, they don't even know what a Bible is. They might see it's a Bible, but they've never read it. This is, now I spent six years inside that. Uh, rules of the game come from my experience inside that. And that's our class. So this was, this is something I, I put together five, in 2005. And if you notice the date on somewhere, it says 2005 on there somewhere. You'll see in a second. Uh, four, I'm sorry, 2004. This is 2004. Dibdo was at Andrews. I was doing something on the 1040 window. So now this is from 2004. It's a long time ago. And I thought when I saw this this morning, I got up early. This morning, the math of evangelism, I said, that's not accurate now. There's not six billion people in the world. It changed. I typed in worldmeters.com, and this is what comes up. It gives you current world population right now. How many people? Almost, almost eight billion. Eight billion. So I thought, yeah, this I got. I got to redo my math, uh, but I didn't. By the way, you want a, a fact? In China, in when I was there, there were 1,500 cities in China with more than a million in population and not one Christian in any of them. Now there were Christians in some, but there were 1,500 where there was not one. If you went to one city a day, how many days would it take you to go to 1,500 cities? <laughs> Thanks, Mason Matthew. 1,500 days. How many years is that? You go five years from one huge city to another, not one Christian in any of them. Now, there's some in Beijing and other places, Shanghai and everything, but there's none in that many cities. Now, the population has been jacked up to almost 8 billion now, right? Mm -hmm. Now, world o -meter, you go down to the bottom, you click religions, and now blow it up so you can read it. I thought, i got to revise my figures. The Christians today, what? Less now than it was back then. Mm -hmm. I thought, I don't need to change my math. 
there are less Christians now than there was back then. Population's gone up by a billion and a half, and the Christians are continue to go down. Shock of a challenge. Only a person who has uh, clocks with me now. Shock of a challenge. An article by John Dibdell coming out of Andrews. A person who has attempted to share Jesus with committed adherents of these religions, Hindus, Buddhists, and Muslims, can appreciate the challenge to evangelism they present. 2% of this area of the world is Christian. The 3 billion people living in the 10, because some of that's changing now because the population's up. This is old. The 3 billion people living in the 1040 window have close to 60% of the world's population. It's higher than that now. Now not because the poor people are the ones that are prospering and growing in population. Um, 9 out of 10 countries with the largest non-Christian populations are there. Including, and that's old. I've got the new figures. Those are old. Not even close now. 900 million Muslims, 600 million Hindus, and 400 million Buddhists. Old as the hills. The need is great in other spheres of life as well. Over 80% of the world's poorest people, those making less than $500 a year, live there. The impact of life on, the impact of this poverty touches all areas of life. Crazy. Now, this member, 2004. Inside the window, you will find... Somebody read these. Give us the facts here. 77% of the Irish people groups in the world. 97% of the least survivalized nations of the world. All 50 of the world's most unreached mega cities. 80% of the poorest people. 1 billion people live in absolute poverty. Less than a dollar. And there's my source, right? United Nations Human Development Report 2000. I did this in 2005. So what you see, those are the figures from 2005, mm -hmm. which are not even nearly accurate today. Now hold that thought for a second. I have this book scanned and on a PDF file. Uh, it was a combination, the great uh, Adventist historian A.W. Spaulding, Two of his books, Captains of the Host and Christ's Last Legion, were combined in the origin and history of Seventh-day Adventists. They're excellent. I've got it. If you want it, send me an email. I'll email it to you. Origin and history. One chapter deals with this man. What's his name? Any guesses? I'll give you a hint. Barry and Springs, higher education. James. Jay and Andrews. John Nevins Andrews. Barry and Springs, they renamed what? Andrews. Yeah, Andrews. Yeah, started out. Uh, now, Andrews is a distinctive man, right? He was our first what? If you want the home to prosper, you leave the. Oh, yeah, he was the first. The uh, first to leave home. Was it, um, was it Switzerland? Switzerland. Switzerland? Yeah, he, loved, he was the first one to leave. Yeah. Origin and history of Seventh day Adventists. You know, it'd be hard to believe this if there hadn't been so many hundreds of people there to see it. Camp meeting was appointed to convene a short distance west of Battle Creek in the summer of 1874. That's when they sent him out. Just prior, 44, 54, 64, 30 years for the first man to leave home. Sent by and ordained and commissioned by the church. In the summer of 1874, just prior to the departure of our first missionary to a foreign field, an elder Andrews was present. When the expansion of the message was dwelt upon and notice was given the world... Uh, that he would soon leave for Europe. Change come over there. By the way, Andrews uh, didn't last long. He left in 74. They buried him in Switzerland in 83. He didn't last long. Would soon, a change came over the meeting. I understand that. But then it said a change came over Andrews. And Elder Andrews, who had never before appeared so solemn at once, seemed to be altered as an appearance. Hundreds of people looked at him and said, hey, he's, cha he's changing in his outward appearance. <laughs> his face shone with such pronounced brightness that as I saw him and heard his apparently inspired words of quiet contentment to be anywhere with the Lord, I thought of the story of Stephen, whose face was as it had been. People, hundreds of witnesses, he's shining. This man is shining. Where was he going? He's going to leave home. What happens to the work at home when you leave? That's the first rule. Now, from the days of Andrews getting on the boat until now, these are the facts based on the numbers in 2005. The picture is much more bleak now because the population is not 6,500,000,000. It's close to 
eight billion. So the numbers are not accurate. They're much worse. Mm -hmm. I got my little calculator out. Growth factor. Three million people added to the church books in 2005. Praise the Lord, right? It's good. A hundred million people added to the population. Two billion, two hundred and three million Christians now divided by six billion, six hundred million. Instead of the world being 33.8% Christian, now it's... And from Andrews walking on the boat until today, it's going down. down. <laughs> we are losing ground. And we want Jesus to come? Jesus says, forget it. <laughs> it's 20 whenever, 2020, forget it. Because you ain't playing by the rules the of the game. Current world population, remember, there that was and there this is. We have less today than they had back then. And the numbers are skyrocketing upwards in the poor countries. I'll pray. That's it for today. We take up tomorrow where we leave off today. Our Father in Heaven, we're thankful that as we uh, study rule number two tomorrow, we can expect a great blessing. The challenge that we face, that I face, full of self. Just full of self. It's all about me. The world revolves around me. What's in it for me? What are you going to do for me? Something's got to change. Have mercy and help me and help, our, uh, her, help my precious brothers and sisters. As we mean business, I'm serious. I want to know how to play this game. I am playing to win by God's grace. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.